Hello and welcome to another podcast from Hotel Technology. Today we're fortunate enough to be joined by Richard Jones. Hello, Richard. Good morning, sir. How are you? Very nice to see you again, Richard. And welcome nice to, to another you. podcast. Richard, I might get you to explain your background, your professional background, if you wouldn't mind, and how it is you ended up to be where you are today, please. Okay, sure. I think the, the very short version of it is I'm on Startup 20, um, 13 that I founded or co-founded, 7 that I've um, helped with. Uh, I've just evolved to this position that you're trying to do things which make a difference. And so in the in the kind of the broadband of the telecom space, um, deploying networks into areas where you're going to increase the GDP for countries, trying to sort out post-regime change countries such that they can do e-commerce, that they have the right kind of um, laws in place that they can support themselves going forward in a stable way. Um, deploying uh, broadband into uh, kind of the UK and Zambia and doing a, a data center in the in Sweden. But there's just been this evolution of actually doing things which are interesting, um, doing things which are fun, not really having a traditional career because I just find something something new and exciting to do. I think it's management of my career by, ooh, a shiny thing. And um, lastly, working in the digital health space and just recognizing that there's a huge amount which can be done. and. Uh, it kind of needs to be done because healthcare is fundamentally unsustainable. So try to help people and um, be very fortunate enough to be helped by other people who are like-minded and want to make a difference. So Richard, how did you end up with Copeland Clinic? Um, so it's just a mutual friend who actually was um, defrauded by a major organisation and myself and the CEO of, um, of C2AI were, were both helping him in different ways. And at a certain point he said, why don't you guys talk to each other? So I had a, a chat with Steve McKenney, who's one of the... Um, He's one of my favorite people on the planet. He's a, an extraordinary uh, sharp mind, egoless, wants to do the right thing, thoroughly principled. Uh, we got along, we started sort of working together a little bit and um, coming up, I guess, early next year for five years later, uh, we're still doing it. I just recognized that what they had was completely unique. And the more I understood it, the better it gets. So it's one of those ones where you kick the tires harder and harder and harder and it just gets better and better. Okay. But could you explain a little bit about Copeland Clinic, please? Yeah, the, um, the underlying thing, I guess, there's an analytics platform built on 450 million patient records from 47 countries now, thank you, Western Samoa, um, which have been derived over a period of time and can be used in a, in a number of different ways. And if I just kind of illustrate it with a story now, it's very simple that there will be people who are going home to their kids without long-term impact on their, their quality of life who would not without the work of Graham Copeland and the, and the team. There are people, um, I'm sometimes asked from an AI perspective, do you, do you talk to the voice of the patient? Do you, actually, do you actually consider that? And actually the only question I could ask some people is, are you glad you're not dead? And <clears throat> I kind of assume that I know what the answer to that's going to be. So what that platform is able to do is a number of different things. So we're prioritizing the elective waiting list in the UK. And there's, there's various people kind of playing around the edges of it. The NHS and a number of other countries recognize that that and other systems that we have are unique. There's no competitor for what we do. And what it means is you're taking the emergency admissions um, from people on the waiting list down by 8%. That's an awful lot of pressure that you're taking off A&E. That's an awful lot of pressure that you're taking off beds um, in hospitals. And something like 125 bed days taken uh, off per thousand patients because you're getting them at the right time. You're not letting somebody deteriorate while they wait. You're recognizing who they are and getting to them early. But another slice of that is to say, well, let's look at the people who will be on the waiting list for a long time. Who could do with modification of their underlying comorbidities? That Waiting Well program has a, an 80 um, out of 100 net promoter score. So patients love it. And with our friends at Surgery Hero, the outturn of that is about a 4.2 bed day reduction in length of stay <clears throat> excuse me, for patients who are uh, essentially fairly low acuity. You put that together, you're taking a bed day per patient off everyone in the, the waiting list. So it's that kind of big ticket impact. But we can keep using it in different ways. So within the life sciences perspective, we can start to look at unmet needs. There's some really interesting things that we're doing there. And I guess the final example would be in, in chronic condition care. In primary care, identifying the areas where provision of, of, of care for the most serious chronic conditions that basically keep people in hospital a long time and cost a lot of money is insufficient. So where is there a high clinical risk burden? And this wouldn't be a postcode, this is a sub-postcode area. And so as a as an ICS or a region or as a health system, <clears throat> excuse me, rather than targeting everywhere with a shotgun, you're targeting the right places with a sniper rifle 
And with a finite amount of money um, available in healthcare, somebody in Mayo Clinic said the other day, that's the first sensible use and thing I understand about precision population healthcare. So it's this whole panoply of tools, and we, we constantly come up with new ways of using this, that just enable you to do things better, improve patient outcomes, and stretch the healthcare pound, euro, or dollar further. And, and as far as I'm concerned, that's a, that's a good thing. Tell me, how much of the NHS are you in currently? <clears throat> We've got an ICS deployment in Cheshire and Merseyside have been phenomenal. They're just very far thinking. They, they really have um, been an amazing support along with Innovation Agency or, or Health Innovation Northwest as it is now. Um, we've got, we're dotted all over the place. So we're in Imperial and Frimley. Um, we're in um, a variety of places in the Midlands and the Southwest. It would love to, lovely to be a, do a national deployment, but unfortunately, that's not quite how the NHS works. It's a, a command and control approach sometimes would be useful, and we keep being recommended for a national approach, but then the fund, the underlying funding changes. So um, a lot, and there's a lot of excitement now at ICS level because other ICSs are, are kind of seeing that, and hopefully the dominoes will topple. Would your system adopt other <laughs> interesting systems that look at patient sepsis and ideas like that? We're actually pretty good at reducing sepsis ourselves, but the identification of sepsis in patients who have gone septic is something that other people are, are looking at. We think it's a real, a real difficult challenge. Um, so we can we can help reduce the instances of sepsis, but I think as a, as a on a sort of per patient basis, there are other people who are better at that. But if you think about similar triggers of avoidable harm, like acute kidney injury in hospital acquired pneumonia, um, we can take acute kidney injury down overall by about fifty percent. And the only reason it's just 50% is that half the people come in with it already. So you can't prevent them getting something they've already got. Hospital acquired pneumonia down about 60%. Now, if you look at that in, in NHS terms, that's probably 70,000 lives and about a billion pounds of in your OPEX that you're saving. And that's two things that we measure across 3,300 in ho hospitals. So it's the whole of acute care. And there's maybe another thing which is was super powerful about it. If you rock up to a hospital or a system today, the IT team will say, well, we're doing an epic um, deployment. Talk to us in three years. This requires two days of their time. That's all. And no clinician workflows change. So you're not suddenly <clears throat> you're not suddenly burdening a clinician with this concept of um, here's this new system you need to understand that will do 0.001% of what happens in a hospital. We're covering the whole of acute care and beyond. One system, no integration, no clinical workflows change and they trust it so it does make it pretty easy to just as with anything in life like you get into your car you turn the ignition on and a warning light comes up and says specifically this is wrong it's not like driving a car from 1910 where kind of you would drive along until the wheels fell off or it blew up and you'd have no early warning you can say precisely where to look there's no issues of false positives and people like that because they've been chasing down stuff for some considerable time that actually is a false positive you have high pneumonia in your hospital. Uh, well, it's not a surprise. We're a tertiary hospital. We've got elderly people in here. It's the winter and we've got COVID as well. Are you surprised we've got a lot of pneumonia? Oh, no, no, but you've got a lot of pneumonia. That's a bad thing. Uh, right. Well, where is it compared to this broad average? It's not what we do. We actually do something really exciting, which is we risk adjust on every individual patient level and then do that at scale. So we looked at something like 25 million patients recently. Um, no clinicians were involved in that. It was two days of the IT times team, our team's time. And we were then able just to pull together these insights that I think in that system could save something like 500 million US of OPEX pretty simply. So there's two bits to it. Can you spot where the issues are and how to resolve them? And that means a sufficient level of detail so you know where the issue is and then some root cause analysis that goes with that. And that's going to be the future. It's absolutely clear. Does your system run in parallel to an electronic healthcare record system, or does it work within one? Uh, we take the data, which is typically kicked out by one of those, but we don't need those. So um, Epic gives us a, a feed, for example, at a Texas hospital, We're working with Cerna, but um, essentially it's a flat CSV file. So it's like super simple, and um, you can deliver that in a number of different ways. So there's no integration with the EHR. But we work with Epic, Cerna, KPMG, Palantir, PwC, Accenture, McKinsey, Quantum Black, um, Humor, our friends at Surgery Hero, etc. Because they recognize that what we've got is unique. So typically, um, you can integrate the insights in. That's what Palantir do so that they're 
kind of single source of truth actually has has our information embedded within it. But it can also be as simple as um, I'm going to post it to hand. That's unusual. If I had a post in my hand, I could say to you, look, actually, Stephen, it's fine. Your whole health system's fine. There's no issues except this. And I'm giving you a post it. Or I can give you a PowerPoint or I can give you that information in a way you can embed into your own BI system. But essentially, we'll tell you um, really where to pay attention. And I think a super powerful thing as well is when not to pay attention. Don't you worry your pretty little head about this, this, and this, because it's all fine. So rather than wasting time drilling down into areas where there's no issues, actually pay attention where it needs to be paid. So it's a much better use of people's time. And when you've got nurses, for example, spending up to two hours a day on the uh, electronic health record system, entering information, as we reduce complications down, like in a, in a world-renowned hospital, 56% reduction in surgical complications. They have all the badges. They have all the processes. We rock up 56% less complications. That's less time for a nurse actually sat there entering those complications into a, into a system and more time that they can be out in the ward actually caring for people. And with a shortage of staff and in the US, an extraordinary thing that the, I think the average experience level has gone down about 10 years per nurse. So when you have much um, less experienced younger nurses on the staff, let's make their life simple. Let's not give them you know, lots and lots of stuff to do in the HR. Let's get them out and about gaining that experience and doing the face-to-face -face patient care that we know everybody wants to see. So your system is looking at clinical, economic, and social factors? So that's interesting. So we look at clinical factors. <clears throat> we then actually kick out from that economic factors. So for example, in the UK, in-year OPEX cost for an acute kidney injury case is £4,200. In hospital in Texas, it's $14,000. That's not changing staffing, that's not building another hospital, that's not buying another bed. That is just using that information very specifically to say what, what is the incremental cost um, if, if, this, if this happens. So we can actually give you not just a view on quality, which clinicians like, but also a view on what the cost of quality is. So you can start to triangulate down and say, okay, where are our big ticket items that we need to look at? So with consulting firms, they can look across a hundred hospitals and say, right, if we want to make a real big difference quickly, we will look at hospital A, B, F, and J. We'll look at these factors and this will give us a return of this. So then the client hospital's very happy because things are improving quickly and we provide that underlying evidence. The social factors is super interesting because we had, certainly with the prioritization of the waiting list, people saying, oh, what about postcode? So my good friend, Steve Barnett, I've known for 30 years, we live in the same postcode. Um, he's roughly the same age as I am. Um, we have different underlying medical conditions because people are different. If I move now to an area where of um, poor access to exercise in the US, you'd, you know, a food desert, a pharmacy desert type area, um, if my salary changed enormously in a negative fashion, um, what will happen the next day? The simple answer is that you can't drive from those factors and say, right, we, we can interpret your health from the postcode you live in. So our systems do a different thing. They actually look at your underlying health. So social determinants of health do an interesting thing. They determine your health. So if you've lived in that area for 30 years without access to um, good quality food through um, uh, issues with income, lack of provision of exercise, you will have more underlying comorbidities. And so what, you, what we do is we then combine both the operative type and the underlying comorbidities into our prioritization system. So everybody's treated fairly, because if not, what do you do? Okay, you live in this postcode, we're gonna put you 10% up the list. Why isn't it five? Why isn't it 15%? We're gonna put you 10 places up. Well, some people have got a list of 1,000, some people have got a list of 25,000. So that's not gonna work. So everything else is inherently unfair. And certainly if you're doing it manually, we know that even trying to put people into three simple buckets of P2, see you in the next month, P3, month one to three, P4, three months and beyond, 15% of people are in the wrong bucket when surgeons do that manually. We kind of very politely, as we saw that, pointed that out to surgeons, and there was 99% agreement that people were in the wrong bucket. So that's surgeons who are notoriously, um, they care, they're risk averse, they're going to challenge stuff. They went, no, you're right. So the outturn of this is really interesting. When you look at people scientifically and fairly, you'll then see a list. And when we look at 
a particular risk profile within that, so say a 10% risk of uh, complication, we'll find 100 patients of European heritage in affluent areas. We'll find 155 patients of Afro-Caribbean heritage. We'll find 183 of European heritage, but in poorer areas. So in other words, if you look at the results, the people who have those poor social determinants of health, it determines their health. They have more comorbidities. So naturally, we position them into the right place on the list. They can live in a place for 30 years or a day. It doesn't matter. The impact on their health is what matters. It's fair, it's equitable, it's transparent, and it's the only way to do it. So those factors do get um, do get indeed smooshed into the uh, into the calculations, but in a very scientific fashion. Let's talk about sepsis, shall we? Sure. What can you? What does the system do for sepsis in a hospital setting? So what we what we're doing is we're looking across a variety of um, different things. So surgical complications. We're looking across matnia. We're looking across triggers of avoidable harm, including sepsis. And with that, without the need to do any separate testing, without the need to do any separate reporting. Because we're looking across this massive range of things, on occasion we'll be saying to a hospital, look, sepsis is going up. Now, that seems like a relatively simple thing because we're not, we're not, we're doing much more than counting stuff. We're making the inference from the data that somebody is a septic patient. Um, so very simply, if I say to you, okay, sepsis is going up, it doesn't seem like a massive revelation. We're looking at 3,300 different things. So it might be that that's something that, we worked with you on, we worked with a, a hospital, won a um, uh, highly commended HSJ uh, awards for reducing acute kidney injury. But then some of the hospitals we've worked with, their attention goes elsewhere because hospitals are entropy machines. Nothing stays static. Six months later, we've got to say, and by the way, this is creeping up again. And the underlying thing, which is super important here is it's risk adjusted against the um, profile of patients that you have. So for a lot of the metrics, Rather than just saying you have a lot of um, chest infections or a lot of wound dehiscence or you have a lot of um, caesareans, risk adjusting, say, for mother and baby, we can tell you what is justified and what isn't justified. And if I just sort of slide off the sepsis example for a second, go to Matt Neo. Of the last six scandals that have been in Matt Neo in the UK, apart from the Lucy case, which we wouldn't have seen coming, the previous five would have seen coming and warned the hospital that things were going sideways. Matney is pretty darn complicated, but actually, rather than just counting stuff, and if I hear one more person say, oh, we've got a lot of data, yeah, you need a lot of insights. This risk adjustment at mum and baby level or at surgical level, medical level, um, ward-based care, it just gives you these insights relative to the patients you've got. As opposed to, I think in 2016, one in three heart, um, uh, heart surgeons was ducking high-risk operations according to the Daily Telegraph, because the raw complication rate, in other words, what percentage complication have I got or raw mortality rate, would go up because it's a dumb way of measuring things. We had the head of inspectorate would, would ring us up and say, what about the surgeon who's been suspended? Are they any good? And in one case, we said, yeah, that's the best surgeon three years running in the, in the trust. But the reason you don't see that is because they've taken the higher risk patients and they've done a great job with them. When you risk adjust, they're doing a good job. Equally well, you can see the God complex surgeon who's taken the high risk patients and is doing a terrible job. We can see that. So as a generalization, what we estimate is that 90% of the issues that we see and help resolve are currently invisible in hospitals. And that gives you a huge level of insight. Are you useful for accreditation or for a quality instrument? Let's say I'm the CQC in the UK. Yeah. Would you be a useful instrument for the CQC? Um, very, and without going too far, um, there's some very advanced conversations going on with the CQC who okay. recognise that the value of what we do. We've helped them extensively in the past. For accreditation, um, that's pretty important. So if you look in the US, you, you get the leapfrog accreditation or US news. Um, doesn't really tell you how good things are. And I'm always somewhat somewhat concerned when with sort of patient reported stuff, it's you, you wonder if the quality of the coffee and how nice the receptionist actually has, a, has an input. I don't care about those things. I care about the crunchy, nutsy, boltsy engineering things of, are you saving more lives? Are you leading to people leaving the hospital without complications? Are you reducing down that life-changing stuff? So we do have a conversation going on with one of the, um, uh, in fact, two of the world's largest insurers in terms of actually doing some accreditation specifically for hospitals that relates to the real underlying quality. 
and also using our data to understand better what the insurance burden should be. So if you are using this system, essentially you'll be reducing down, you should in effectively be insuring yourself against most scandals. So that's a big tick. If you can do that, it's a bit like a black box in a car for a 17 year old, you know, you're just really modifying behavior. Um, and that should again, save hospitals money. And it's, for me, it's all about that magic dyad of can you improve patient outcomes and save money at the same time. All right, perfect, thank you. Richard, would you mind talking about the AI aspect of your technology, please? Sure, it's a, it's a really interesting area. Um, I have a fear that I think AI is gonna put healthcare back two years, which is not widely held, but I, I think I've got some good reasons for saying that. So if you think about hospital systems and the companies that are working in AI, um, or that are working in digital health, I can now rock up and say, I've got this really exciting idea and I'm going to use some AI and I'm going to get some data and do this exciting thing. And everybody gives it a certain amount of credence because AI is doing interesting things at the moment. So it means that people who don't necessarily have a handle on how to do things or how to do things right are going to be putting forward a swathe of ideas. Now, a bit like a snake swallowing a pig, except there's multiple pigs, you've got an innovation pipeline with a certain finite number of people. So Northwell, fantastic system in, in New York, it's a two year waiting list if you rock up them with a fully completed app with an API. So now you're rocking up with multiple ideas and it's going to take a while for people to, I think, differentiate between I'm what I lovingly call degenerative AI at one end where, you know, what's your name, Stephen? Your name is Stephen. What's your name, Stephen? Your name is Frank, right? You're going to get those kind of differences. You can't trust it because you can't understand what's going on beneath it. And the other end where we are, 450 million patient records, 47 countries, 30 years of research, refining this down and very much under control. So there's a really interesting thing that's going to happen in the next couple of years. There'll be this sorting out where people say, you know what, I don't really want to look at an app that sorts out 0.0001% of healthcare because the data, you've got 50 data points, that's not enough. There's going to be issues of bias. There's going to be issues of data leakage. I'm putting my data into a chat GPT type thing. Where's that data then going? And we deal with extraordinarily complex governance issues um, and do it the right way. But there's going to be lots and lots of gears meshing the wrong way, I think, for the next couple of years. And then people will just step back and say, right, what are the big ticket items? And that's why people are like what we do, because it's the whole of acute care and beyond, no integration required, no clinical workflows change, more awards probably than any other healthcare company in AI in the world references from clinicians who don't give their references easily basically because they don't want to put their, their their neck on the line and so there will be this this swing back but i think for the next couple of years there's going to be a lot of excitement oh a shiny thing i can have a go at that <clears throat> and the danger is um ai in the next couple of years because of that i can have a go will mean that even more people say no no i don't want to use your sort of tried trusted solution which actually works I'm going to look at the small data set in my own region, try to build something uneconomic where I can't build the economies of scale around it because it's so small. And they're not necessarily thinking this, but this is the reality of it. And in three years time, I've kind of lost, I've lost interest a wee bit. And the thing that I really want to get people focused on <clears throat> and the, why it's interesting with the corporate manslaughter charges potentially coming up in the, the Matt Neo case is this is about people's lives. This isn't about having a go. This isn't about not invented here. So AI is going to kind of set us back. There will be this shift towards solid trust for the AI in the, in the next couple of years, but it's a super interesting. And it's also a little bit like when you talk about branding or things like that, everybody can have a go. I don't like that name. Everybody can have a go with AI, which is a, a plus and a pretty big minus. It's very interesting. I've never heard that perspective before. Thank you very much for your, your insight. Today. I, I, I've enjoyed the meeting. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time today. It's been very, it's been oh, great. Thank you.